Vermilion County has many success stories. Among them is the story of a young man named Joseph Cannon, who, upon witnessing an injustice, took it upon himself to become a lawyer, which then sent him down the path to becoming one of the most important political figures of the late 1800s and early 1900s. Watch his story unfold in this episode of Vermilion History. Joseph Gurney Cannon was born on May 7, 1836, at the Guilford Courthouse near Greensboro, North Carolina, to his mother, Guglielma Cannon, and father, Dr. Horace Cannon. Though Joseph was born in North Carolina, he and his family wouldn't stay there for long. He was born to uh, parents that were of the Quaker faith, and he was raised as a Quaker uh, in that area of North Carolina until his parents decided to migrate from there to Indiana, essentially to escape the slave culture of North Carolina. His mother and father were abolitionists as Quakers. Uh, they abhorred slavery and they wanted to get their family out of North Carolina and they moved to Indiana where they first settled uh, in Monrovia then they went up to a little place called Westfield, north of Indianapolis. And then they ultimately settled in near Annapolis in Park County, Indiana. When Joseph was just 12 years old, he witnessed the social injustice that would change his life forever. His father, being an abolitionist, hired a black man to work in his farm. At that time, in 1848, it was a criminal offense in Park County, Indiana, to hire a black man without that man having posted a $500 bond, which would be almost $20,000 in today's money. Joe's dad had been selected by the Quakers to go south and bring back the slaves in a plantation that had been inherited by a local Quaker family. So he spent several months going south and he brought back a number of black slaves who had been freed got off a boat at Montezuma, faced an angry mob who didn't want the blacks coming into the county. But his father essentially got them into Park County and got them placed. When Dr. Horace Cannon, his dad was a doctor, hired a black man, the county officials got even with him for doing that. They brought an indictment against him for hiring a black man who was not bonded they prosecuted him, he was convicted. The local Quakers said, we'll pay your fine, which was about $28 with cost. Horace Cannon said, no, I'm gonna sit in jail until they sell my property. He ended up sitting in jail probably for about 45 days while they sold some cow, his, his mother's favorite cow and some horses to pay the costs and fine. And he did it as an act of conscious civil disobedience because he wanted the black laws repealed. Now you have a youngster, age 12, watching his dad do this. And this is where Joe learned you have to stand up for your principles no matter what it costs. After witnessing this rank injustice, as Joe later coined it, he slowly became more and more interested in practicing law. A few years after his father's passing, and almost 10 years after this rank injustice, he decided he would take the first step into becoming a lawyer in the year 1857. He wanted to become a lawyer, so Joe decided he'd go off to law school. When he became a lawyer, he initially tried to settle in Terre Haute. Joe ended up in Shelbyville, Illinois. He spent a year there, and he failed miserably as a lawyer. And as a result, he had to move on, and he decided to move to Tuscola, Illinois. As it so happens, Tuscola, Illinois was developed by three men from Park County, 
which is where Joe grew up. And by, by moving there, he had an immediate network to establish and make relationships with people. And at that point, he started making money as a lawyer. It was at this point in Joe's career that he finally began to profit by being a lawyer. After his success as a lawyer, he decided to run for public office. In 1860, the man who was state's attorney at the time decided not to run for re-election in what is now Douglas County, Illinois. And so that year, Joe ran for state's attorney with none other than Abraham Lincoln at the top of the ballot. He ran as a Republican. He lost as well as did Lincoln in Coles County. It was a Democratic uh, county. He wanted to be a state's attorney because he recognized that fees earned by state's attorneys could generate substantial wealth for a young lawyer. 1861, Lincoln is elected. Lincoln is going off to Washington. The Illinois legislature uses the vote totals from the various counties in eastern Illinois, which were growing and needed a brand new circuit uh, court, and they use those numbers to gerrymander a new judicial circuit, the 27th Judicial Circuit, which included Vermillion County, Champaign County, Douglas County, Ford County, and they use those numbers to make it a Republican district. Joe decided he'd run. He was elected by 350 votes. The margin of victory, by the way, was provided principally by the voters of Southern Vermilion County. Southern Vermilion County had two Quaker meeting houses. There were a lot of Quakers there. The, Quakers, the Quaker, Quaker meeting houses down there were in fact monitored by Joe's parents when his parents were living in Park County as a part of the, uh, the Quaker development of other meeting houses. And the Quakers in Southern Vermont County knew Joe's parents. And as a result, when Joe campaigned down there, one of the Quaker ladies said, Joe, we know the parents and we shall vote for you. Joe held the position of state's attorney in Vermilion County through the Civil War. When the time came in 1868, he decided not to run for re-election and went into private practice for roughly four years. However, Joe would return to the political scene when the circumstances happened to weigh in his favor. Come 1872, with the census, they have revised the new congressional districts because of reapportionment. Joe decides, looking at the district, I think I'll run for Congress because four of the six counties in the new congressional district, he had won two elections as state's attorney. They knew him, they knew what he could do, but could he overcome the principal candidate who was probably going to get the nomination, a guy by the name of Tincher from Danville, who was a banker and who was the senior Republican in the area, and Tincher would have had the nomination if he wanted it. Well, Tincher died in December of 1871. That opened up the position and Joe decided he would in fact seek the nomination for Congress. And on the 37th ballot, after a very contentious convention down in Tolono, Joe got the nomination. He ran again as a Republican. He was a Republican to the core until his death. He was a Grant man. Grant won in a landslide in 1872. He took Joe by the coattails and Joe won the district by probably 5,000 votes. That started his congressional career. So he went to Washington as a congressman first in March of 1873. Throughout his career, Cannon had multiple advisors that aided him in his work. His first advisor was his wife, Mary, who he married in 1862. The next was his brother, Bill Cannon, who took care of his finances. William Jewell, owner of the Danville News, was also a trusted consultant to Cannon. Attempting to sum up Joe's career in Congress is no easy task, as he had served for roughly 46 years, from 1873 on through to 1923. To put that into perspective, Joe had been in Congress for almost a fifth of Congress's entire existence. 
He called himself a wheel horse, the horse that was responsible for doing the heavy lifting. He said, I was never interested in the trimmings of government. I was always interested in the business of government. And you can even narrow it down to even more by saying he was interested in the money and how it was spent by the government. Joe's career in Congress is highlighted by the fact that he went on to the Appropriations Committee very early in his career and he was never off it for the, for the vast majority of his years in Congress. Appropriations dealt with how the money was going to be spent by Congress. As a result, he became an expert in getting budget bills through Congress. This was his role as an appropriations member, and he became chairman of the Committee of Appropriations. And as such, he earned the title of being the watchdog of the treasury. He was not the first person to have that uh, title applied to him, but he could say no when congressmen came to him and said, we want money for a particular project. A vice president by the name of Adlai Stevenson from Bloomington once noted that Joe could say no as pleasantly as anybody, and that when he said no, you walked away not feeling hurt because he said you can't have your project. He had the ability to charm people and say no at the same time. One constant through Cannon's career is that he always considered Danville a home. After he moved there with his wife Mary and his two daughters, Helen and Mabel, in the year 1876. He moved into 418 North Vermilion, just south of where the Habitat for Humanity facilities are located today. He never really left Danville as a home. He was very quick to point out he never bought a house in Danville, I mean in, in Washington. He always rented either a hotel room or he rented a home. When he was speaker, he rented a home for eight years so he could entertain but Danville was always his home. He cared greatly for Danville and during his time in Congress used his authority to benefit his hometown in many ways such as founding Danville's federal court and its post office. He was personally involved in both of these projects. A congressman, young congressman, once approached him and said I want to do something in my particular district. How do I do it? Joe said start small get a little bit there and then go back and get a little bit more and then get a little bit more. Well, we're about ready to dedicate the old federal courthouse in the name of Joe Cannon. Joe Cannon started that process in the early 1890s by getting the federal district court to have a term held in Danville, just a term. It was generally set in Springfield at the time. Well, if you got a court coming here, at some point you need a courtroom. Joe gets a courthouse along with a post office. And by 1908, there was so much court business going on in Danville that they needed a brand new courthouse. And the building that we're about ready to dedicate in his honor is the courthouse that he got here. He got the funding. He started small and built on it to get what he wanted done in federal legislation. He practiced what he preached. In 1890, Cannon suffered a rare defeat at the ballot box, a loss attributed in part to not getting the veterans vote. When he saw an opportunity to get an old soldier's home, now known as the VA, built in Danville, he focused efforts on getting the facility built. It was completed in 1898. In the year 1923, Joe Cannon retired. This was huge news across the country as Cannon had been a staple in Congress for as long as most people could remember. In recognition of his 46 years in Congress, his face was on the cover of the first Time magazine. They were sad, but they were also happy for him. He was 86 years old when he retired. And when he retired, uh, they gave all sorts of honorary programs for him. Uh, and uh, when he came home, he just settled in and he spent the last three years of his life 
walking down to his bank. It was the second national bank uh, of Danville. Uh, sitting at his desk, he would go play poker. He would smoke cigars with his friends and just enjoy the company of being in Danville. On November 11, 1926, Joseph Cannon passed away at the age of 90. Congress adjourned to honor him. They held a simple service at the Cannon home two days after his passing, where thousands of Danville residents gathered to mourn the loss of this great leader. In the present day, we remember Cannon by naming the very courthouse he secured so many years before after him and by celebrating his many accomplishments, together with his contributions to Danville and Vermilion County as a whole. Joseph Cannon served as a great example of what it means to be a success, not only with the power that he held, but with the people that admired and respected him. He was a no-nonsense man who had zero tolerance for injustice. As a politician, he saw those around him by more than just their political affiliations. He also saw them as people.